so Genesis 3 where it all goes wrong where sin takes a hold of humanity now, I don't know if people are honest with themselves a lot of people aren't I you know I mess up all the time I don't know how to stop it I try keeping in connection and it's not enough um, and uh, I know that God has taken a personal interest in my life um, and sometimes I don't know why like I just look at myself and think gosh uh, why you know but that's part of the confusion and I don't know how to get past it you know so the fall now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made he said to the woman did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden so the serpent leads with a question that he knows to be false and sets Eve up as being above him or greater than so that Eve will be led into the process of trying to correct the serpent's error even though the error is part of the serpent's con to make it seem like he's uh, wrong but we have another interesting thing here that uh, the serpent is an animal and other, other tellings of this story, uh, it's the, the tempter is the fallen angel, not an animal. So it's again like there are two different versions of this story that are being edited together, which is quite common. Two different tellings that were handed down through oral history, they all got different. So, you know, what does it really mean? Like, do... do is it appropriate then to berate other people for saying that well you know this isn't literally true because well it's different over here than it is over here so how can both those things be true it's not about that it's about what does it mean what does it lead us to think the woman said to the serpent we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die so in this telling of the story there's one tree in the previous telling of the story in the previous chapter there were two trees the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil you will certainly not die the serpent said to the woman for God knows that when you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil well, not quite like God, because God knows how to not do evil. <laughs> the tree of knowledge of good and evil is just like, oh, well, we know what they are. And yet we're still like, oh, wait, but well, we know that they're there, but we don't actually really know what they are. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So, it's not that God made evil. They weren't evil while they were naked and didn't know about it. It's just that now they ate the fruit, and now they have these concepts of good and evil, but not really knowing the mind of God because they aren't like God because the fruit didn't make them like God again the serpent is lying saying that this fruit will make you like God but it doesn't it doesn't because we still don't know what it means we don't know how to judge which is good and evil because we're not omniscient we can't see the grand totality of all events in time and space to be able to judge that in all cases I mean a lot of times we get a good intuition, sure. Mm, philosophers, blah, blah, blah. But it's impossible to be God and to know this is always good and this is always evil. But once you have the concept, 
because if you're still in that place of trying to control, of trying to be like God and thinking that God is controlling everything, then, well, if I'm like God, then, uh, you know, I would think that I would have to control everything, uh, which doesn't add up because I'm not God. So they just have these concepts that they have to apply to the world out of some kind of compulsion now. And so they apply it to their own bodies, which God had made and said, hey, here, go frolic in the garden. And that's all fine. That wasn't evil before they knew what that there was a concept called evil. They didn't know that there was evil in the world. Now they know, oh, some stuff is evil. Well, shoot, I, I still don't see any evil because I'm in Eden. Everything here is good. But there must be evil, so I must be evil. Oh, no. And Or that must be evil, or this must be evil, or that must be evil, or this must be evil. So I'm going to accuse. And that's exactly what why um, in the languages of the original text, the word Satan, which comes up later, means accuser. It's something in your head that calls you to accuse things of being evil which are not. And that is kind of the core of the disease of sin. Is I know that there's evil in the world. Well, I must be evil. And if I'm evil, well, then I might as well do evil things. That's like the logic, I think, that is going on in the brain. But that's based on a lie. It's based on the lie that is told to oneself that God created something evil. God didn't create anything evil. God didn't create us evil anyway. I don't know. If, you know, it's a question for God, whether he created evil. Um, but he didn't create us evil, and he didn't create Adam and Eve evil while they were naked. They weren't. It's just that now they have this concept, and they're like, oh, what do I do with this? Oh, shoot. Oh, man, that must be evil. That's weird. Um, and then on and on and on. Not that I'm encouraging everybody to walk naked down the streets, but, you know, I mean, the weird thing is, is that now that we have this concept that our natural bodies are somehow inherently evil, then, when we're closed, then all of a sudden this taboo of being our natural selves then leads to a whole rationale of thinking that, oh, this is secret stuff that, you know, it must be evil. So anytime anybody takes their clothes off, that must be some kind of evil. And that results in this whole thinking process that goes on in people's minds about uh, rationalizing uh, rape and child abuse and uh, all kinds of uh, suppression of women and culturally, uh, you know, these people who wear these head to toe coverings, like, uh, God didn't make any evil in you, you know, that got in later, that got in through your thinking, through the accuser, um, and, and yes, uh, there is good and evil, God knows what is good and evil, but what the accuser wants you to think is that you know which is evil and which is good in all circumstances and not just the obvious ones. Um, so, I mean, it's confusing. It's confusing. Um, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? So now that they know that there's evil in the world and they think themselves evil, they feel shame. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Again, God is like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being naked. I made you that way, he says. So what? what's the deal? You know, why, why are you tripping on, on the state that I made you in? Um, 
in, in a in a wonderful place that I've given you here to live in. What's 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 the problem? Why are you tripping? You know. The man said, "The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it." <laughs> so here we go, blaming the woman. Then the Lord God said to the woman, "What is this you have done?" The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman said, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So, originally, they were equals. It's only after the fall that Eve gets this I'm less than the man thing, which stands to reason that if women can overcome the low self-esteem that has been drilled into them since they were children and see themselves again as equals, we could get back on an even footing with God. And it's not just men. It's not just men who enforce that, although plenty of men, sure, yeah, it's a man's world, etc. You know, plenty of men enforce that and we're bigger and stronger and, you know, whatever. But there are plenty of women out there who go along with it, thinking that that's the way it's supposed to be, like God created a, created humans that way, and God didn't create humans that way. It was the result of all this other business, of the corruption. God created a sequel, says the story. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through the, uh, through painful toil you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Which sort of implies that God created the first humans to be immortal. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion in science about the decay of, of cells and so forth that that doesn't have to be the way things are. That there seem to be mechanisms um, as part of the living process that may someday be understood enough to turn them off, um, the mechanisms that cause us to age and decay and die, uh, while we're still, you know, sort of wanting to be here. And this notion that somehow this form that we've got, this sort of fleshy junk here, um, is like the end-all to be-all of life is just foolish. I mean, the universe is very, very big. It's entirely plausible that some advanced super being could figure out how to make us immortal or even transfer our consciousness to a, an immortal body of some kind. The living water that gets discussed later. But, you know, or that the people that the being that created us is, you know, already understands that. And that was how we were created in the beginning. And then um, somehow we lost it. And he was like, okay, you know, I created this consciousness. I used a template from a primate to, to make it. And uh, it didn't go so right. So instead of, instead of leaving you as immortal super beings who were going to live in a state of nature and beauty, beautiful garden for the rest of time... Uh, screw you, you're going to die like the animals. I mean, that's basically God's reaction. And one of the things that's apparent here is, um, 
uh, the axiom of shit rolls downhill. So, uh, at, you know, God says to Adam, hey, what did you do? And Adam's like, mm, I didn't do it, she did it. And then Eve's, and so God's like, hey, what did you do? And Eve's like, mm, I didn't do it, he did it. And points at the serpent, you know, like, uh, and God just says, well, none of you are taking responsibility for your actions, so here you go. And that seems to be the real thing about this story is that God wants us to take responsibility for our actions. And um, not only that, but sometimes it's impossible to do so. So what do we do with that? You know, how do I take back all the unkind words to people that I've ever said? You know, I don't even know them anymore. I don't know who they are. I can't remember. It's a big world with lots of people, you know. Maybe I said an unkind word to somebody in a parking lot 15 years ago. How do I take that back? How do I apologize to that person? Would apologizing do any good if I just do it again tomorrow to somebody else? You know, and that's where we have to, I have to work on myself and also admit that I can't. I can't. I can't fix that, you know. And as James says, uh, James? Yeah, I think it was James. No man can tame the tongue. And, and that's why we have the need for a spiritual being who can live with us in our minds and restrain our negative emotions, all this negative stuff that came from the beginning. Um, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Um, the name... Hebrew Hawaii suggests the woman's unique role since it sounds like the Hebrew word that means to give life. Hawaii. Um, the Lord God made, that was a footnote, the Lord God made garments for of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and all, take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work on the ground, to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden, e Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So, um, what does that even mean? So, the cherubim, I don't know, what is a cherubim? Some kind of angelic space being of incredible power, interdimensional alien? I don't know, some kind of thing. And it says you're not allowed to go there. So where is there even? You know, that we're not allowed to be immortal uh, anymore. And God says, you know, uh, too bad. You know, you didn't... I, I, I gave you the facts. You didn't learn from what I was telling you. Uh, so now you're going to learn the hard way. And to be mortal for all of your generations... Um, and that's what he says at the beginning. And what becomes clear later on is, you know, God keeps trying, though. He keeps trying to say to people, hey, you know, I really like you guys. Here's, here's some stuff for you that, you know, might be a better way to live. And um, we kept screwing it up. And keep screwing it up. I keep screwing it up on a daily basis. I did I did today. I said an unkind word to somebody who, you know, was unkind to me. But what does that do? What, what good does it do to respond that way? And um, I just don't know, you know, and uh, I don't know what to do about it. You know, I, I'm at a loss. Uh, but the message from the rest of the book is that that changes. Is that God's... Uh, becomes more merciful 
um, to those who reach out and ask for help uh, and that we're not doomed to a mortal existence but we have to suffer through it to learn something and we have to suffer through the uncertainty of not knowing whether God is actually there or not really was it I saw in a show uh, um, actually it was the show Supernatural where Lucifer is saying uh, you know God ever present in your thoughts but in reality missing in action something like that um, nowhere to be found and isn't that interesting but the thing is is that allowing God to be ever present in thought makes life better for those who have like I uh, like myself reached a point of desperation and to see how that works is really interesting but you know that that there's and the message from the gospel when we get there <laughs> I hope we get there it's a huge book huh is that there's there's hope for anyone and that God um, this isn't the final word of God this isn't it this isn't the end and that's where I think a lot of Bible thumpers, you know, get back into the original stuff and say, you see, you see, you're blah, 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 blah. And that makes, gives them a little rush in their head or something. It makes them feel high. Um, but that's the accuser reaching out in them to accuse God of making something evil. And he didn't. And that's uh, where we've forgotten who we are and I think that that's that's what where I hope we get back well it all goes downhill from here <laughs>